Uh, hello, hello, hello. Uh, thank you very much for once again coming to my humble home. Uh, my name is Lord Hardthrasher, second Viscount of Irritant, and current holder of the 500 metre breaststroke whilst carrying a tea tray gold medal from Oxford, and you are about to join me on a journey once again into the Battle of Britain. Uh, I'm doing this a little sooner than I had planned to. Uh, her ladyship's moon is in Aquarius. Uh, I am a supportive and modern husband, so naturally the dogs and I are hiding in the study waiting for the storm to break. Uh, we did try and join Jenkins in the potting shed, not least because I know he has a still in there, but he's bolted the door and turned the radio up, the coward. Uh, my pain, however, can be your pleasure, so to speak, so let us, between cautious sallies back and forth to the kitchen for provisions, record and edit this video together. Uh, a word of warning up front, this is a little longer and perhaps a little more sober than some of my previous offerings due to the nature of the content, but I hope nonetheless that you find it interesting. Uh, for those that may have not been here before, this is the fourth and I suspect probably final part of the series. Uh, you do not need to watch the rest of them for this to make any sense. I and the algorithm I serve, however, would be delighted if you were to go back and look at the first three. We will wait for you here. For everyone else, as you will recall from the last two parts, we looked in turn at first the German plan and the opening phases of the fighting, and then at the Dowding system. Uh, talking of which, you'll be delighted to know that after the last video, I have had an approach by the big wood chipper company of Ohio of the United States. How very lovely. Uh, they would like me to encourage you to acquire one of their shiny new Dowding brand wood chippers. According to the particulars that they gave me, uh, where are we? Uh, here we are. Uh, with tungsten and carbon reinforced blades, the Dowding can process trees of up to six foot five and 200 pounds and now comes with a free mini chainsaw for removing unwanted limbs for easier processing. The whole thing is painted in reflective UV paint and is easy to take apart and clean. Buy one now and they will apparently throw in four pounds of stuffy branded quick lime, a bunny suit, some nitrile gloves and a Dowding branded shovel. Well, what a fine deal that is and I'm sure we can all imagine a person who richly deserves such a thing. Uh, formalities concluded to the letter of the contract, let us move on. Today we will continue with the timeline of the battle and stop periodically as pleases me to consider key topics. We will start by picking up on Eagle Day in early August, and then I'm going to try and talk a little bit about tactics, what conclusions that forced the Luftwaffe to make, uh, a little bit about the aircraft themselves, why the .303 round wasn't necessarily as awful as you might think, a little about the men who flew and what motivated them, and then in the last phase we will discuss the critical final days of the battle from roughly the end of August to the middle of September. Uh, as ever, I warn new viewers that I will occasionally use the odd naughty word, so headphones are probably smart, and furthermore, whilst I claim to be a historian, I am in fact just a man wittering on the internet, so please take everything I say with a pinch of salt. I would welcome comments and input, and if you would like to send me a particularly long message, please feel free to do so. I have an email address, it's lordhardthrasher at gmail.com, uh, where I will give your missive due care and attention. Uh, and also, if you enjoy this video, please do hit the like button and subscribe and comment below for the algorithm. If you are British, let me ask you this question. Have you ever tried to barbecue during the summer? For those of you who are unfortunate enough not to live on these shores, what you have to do is to stalk your proposed barbecue, much as you might stalk, say, a deer or a large pig. You must never, under any circumstances, look at it in the eyes. You can only invite your friends over for supper. You cannot say, would you like to come over for a barbecue? Because if you do that, although it has been 25 degrees centigrade for three solid weeks, it will then snow on the appointed day. People who say, would you like to come over for a barbecue? in Britain are people who enjoy wearing shorts in a thunderstorm. If you receive such an invitation, you're allowed to say, yes, I would like to come for supper, and but you need to make sure that you pack both all of your waterproofs and your Factor 50 sun cream. This is what passes for summer in the United Kingdom, and any dissident on this island would have therefore been able to tell the Luftwaffe High Command that any plan that relied on three days of good weather is going to end in disaster. And so it proved. First, the... The Reichsmarschall baby set Eagle Day for the 11th of August, but the weather forecasters frowned and said that it would rain on the 11th. Frustrated but prepared to compromise, he pushed back his start day for two days, that is to the 13th, whereupon the British summertime decided to dick with him a little bit and put the sun into the sky on the 11th. The Luftwaffe got all excited and pulled Eagle Day forward 24 hours to the 12th, at which point, naturally enough, it began to rain. Frantically, Goering tried to postpone back to the 13th, but not before half of his air force had taken off, whilst the other half did get the message and stayed at home. An auspicious and brilliant start. Rotations with the weather, Eagle Day marked the start of a sort of month and a half or so of decisive battle period. What was envisioned was a knockout blow in the originally, but it, what it became was a slugging match instead. And we will attempt to follow that slugging match by zooming in and out on the action as we go. And the first artefact we should note is Goring's willingness to really screw around with his commanders. Having sent them all off on the attack on the 12th, just two days later, the fat one dictated that they should all come and join him back at the 
Kachenhol to discuss the battle. There were several dozen of them and only one of him, but he was the Reichmarschall baby by this point, so they set off to fly the 500 miles directly away from their various command posts to see him. Meanwhile, their pilots flew some 2,000 sorties, essentially without adult supervision. Uh, nearly a hundred of them would be dead before the commanders got back again. The trip was absolutely worthwhile and the Luftwaffe got right down to... Oh, no, no, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm lying again. I, I do apologise. The other thing, absolutely the other thing. It was a colossal waste of effort and energy right in the middle of the battle. There were various claims from the wonderful Beppo Schmidt and his unintelligence officers of about 300 RAF machines destroyed, but something wasn't quite right. And this set the pattern for the battle. Uh, like an excited puppy trying to find a ball that his owner hasn't actually thrown, Goering would be left all optimistic and bouncy whenever Schmidt opened opened his mouth and said something like, but how many fighters can they have left? And he would bound off to the OKW or Hitler and tell them it was all going swimmingly and that they would win the war any minute. And then a few days later, when nothing had really changed and he got the casualty reports across his desk, he'd get all moody and upset and blame his pilots for lying to him. On subsequent days, it became clear that whatever they might be doing to the RAF, the RAF was doing something quite unpleasant to them, involving no lubrication at all. And there was a tactical pause whilst they sorted themselves up and tried to come up with what I'm going to call cunning plan number two, which I think of more accurately as the Stukas strike back. Uh, the temptation of all staff of all armies at all times has been come up with some clever, super-intelligent, multi-layered attack plan built like a Swiss watch. You carefully design your enemy's worst nightmare in detail with gears and hands and springs that all mesh together just so to produce the perfect result. And as anyone who's ever walked, sailed or flown into combat will be able to tell you, things always go to shit within about five minutes with bits of carefully tensioned spring and gearing and body parts flying in all directions. And so this proved for Luftflotte too. When they tried to launch was a phased attack with some low-level raids mixed in with some Stuka attacks, and then a defender, as the defenders were down and refueling, sending a massive wave of lightly escorted bombers to destroy them on the ground. This plan relied on coordination and timing and good weather. In an air force spread out over 200 miles of northern France, split into two distinct air fleets that weren't talking to one another, incorporating three types of aircraft who didn't have radio contact the moment they took off, utilising the aforementioned barbecue weather of the British summer. Well, as Jesus said, the first shall become last and the last shall become first in this case meaning that the elements that were supposed to be doing the surprise follow-up raid appeared first and were cut to pieces that then woke the defenders up who kicked seven bells out of the second wave that had now become the first wave who then broke for home left the fighter supporting thin air who then promptly ran out of fuel so they broke for home just in time for the stukas to turn up and learn important life lessons about trying to operate in contested airspace various stuka formations lost between 30 percent and 80 percent of their number an individual gruppen were caught forming up or coming out of the dive and massacred. In all, the Luftwaffe lost 69 destroyed and 31 damaged on the 18th, compared to the RAF's 34 and 39 respectively. For those following along at home, this was supposed to be attack wave number three, the one that was going to rip the RAF from the sky according to the original plan, and instead the RAF had pegged them good. Uh, Luftflotte 2 and 3's general staff were as confused as a heterosexual male presented with a hot femboy for the first time. Uh, losses over the channel in the whole of July had been around 200 machines, and in just seven days of fighting they had now lost more than 300. I mean, obviously Beppo was trying to tell everyone that the RAF was wiped out, but this was starting to look a little foolish, and it was clear that something needed to change. On the 21st then, the Eichmasch baby recalled his staff once again back to Karen Hall for yet another planning conference, and they all sat around feeling frightfully sorry for them themselves trying to come up with a new approach. The conclusions that they drew were broadly thus. Both Kesselring and Spell's forces had lost a lot of fighters. The RAF tactics meant that more were needed than had been anticipated to escort each wave of bombers. Uh, furthermore, the range issues for Spell's fighters in particular in the south were causing them to ditch in the channel on a regular basis, and this was considered a suboptimal outcome. Spell's bombers, on the other hand, had been had the seven shades of shit kicked out of them and weren't really in any position to carry on. Therefore, they decided to switch his bombers to night attacks and move his fighters north to join Kesselring Luftflotte 2. It was, in fact, admitting the defeat of Air Fleet 3 and Hugo Sprell. From here on out, our favourite Nazi beefcake would spend most of the rest of the war drinking and whoring across France before he was finally fired in 1944 as the Allies advanced. The OKL decided that they wanted to spice things up a bit in the Staffels to promote some dudes with some big D energy, as the kids say these days. Uh, they picked out a handful of aces, or experten, who were to take command in key roles, and some of the guys, like for example Theo Osterkamp, who we mentioned last time, were off to other important roles across the Luftwaffe, like for example Inspector of Wheelnuts and Chief of Staff to the Office of the Reich Latrines Unit, and so on. This brought a certain aggressive spirit to the fore, and the operational effectiveness of the fighter wings in particular did begin to improve almost 
almost immediately. On the other hand, none of these men would question orders from above, nor provide truthful assessments of the fighting. Weirdly, claims went up far faster than actual kills did from this point. The Stukas were beyond fucked up after their recent experiences and were withdrawn, without really any real hope of being able to come back into the fighting any time soon. This left the Luftwaffe without any precision target hitting capability, just as well then that they weren't going to try and hit any precision targets, like for example, I don't know, just picking off the top of my head an example that I hadn't really thought of before, uh, an airfield say, or a radar station, or a, god forbid, a, a sector control room. Oh dear. Anyway, uh, presumably after a jolly good meal and a lot of champagne and wine and schnapps and so forth, they had all decided that if the aim was to take the RAF out, they should probably go and take the RAF out and not focus on things like the Navy or the Army or production targets or any of that rubbish. One more push would surely do it. Uh, I think if I'd been <coughs> if I'd been in the room as part of the uh, Oberkommander der Herr or Oberkommander der Navin, I might have had something to say about that, but they weren't in the room, so this was just the OKL having a chat amongst themselves. They also added the rider, and I simply don't understand why. They said they should not attack any airfield more than twice in a row, which was very good of them, as it gave the RAF plenty of time to make sure that they got all the holes filled in, the fuel bowsers off to the side and so forth, and were ready for the next load of planes. Honestly, I don't know what they were taking, but I'd quite like to try some. As we discussed a minute ago, fighter cover was increased on all rates. This put enormous strain on the pilots, so they decided that at least for now, they would let the fighters act more like cavalry and go free and up high and in front. Of course, as we all know over the years, cavalry have never ever, not once in history, fucked off over yonder hill chasing the enemy, leaving the fighting to carry on. If that did happen to the bomber crews, then the pilots really did need to make sure that they'd filled out the life insurance forms properly when the hurricanes came a-calling. Uh, to somewhat placate the feelings of those poor put upon bomber crews, Goring generously assigned the ME110s to escort them close in. Now, Goring loved his, his sister, but realistically, if they were going to get kills, they were only going to do it by bouncing the enemy. And once they were in and amongst the bombers, they couldn't do that anymore, which meant that they had to go round in circles. We'll kind of talk about them a little bit more later on. What this was really doing was creating a target rich environment for Park's Hurricanes. To use a bit of a Donald Rumsfeldism, this plan neither addressed the known unknowns or the unknown unknowns. The unknown knowns were the operations rooms at Uxbridge and Sector Control and Tangmere and Biggin Hill and Kenley and elsewhere, and the known unknowns were the radar stations, neither of which was due to be targeted. Whilst the Luftwaffe played musical chairs and considered cunning plan part three, Return of the Geschwader, Dowding was looking using this lull to sort out his shit a bit too, moving squadrons between 10, 11, 12 and 13 group to try and give some of them a rest and bring others in. He was also able to switch on 302 Polish, 310 Czech, and on the 18th the 1st Canadians, and on the 19th the wild men of the 303 Polish, who weren't actually made operational yet, were given permission to, quote, patrol above their base whilst armed, which is RAF for, these fuckers are bonkers, we might as well let them kill some Nazis. They would actually become operational on the 31st, and as we'll discuss in a moment, they killed 126 enemy during the course of the fight, making them the single most effective unit in fighter command. Actually, you know what, this is a reasonable moment to pause for a second. Let's put the narrative to one side, and let's consider consider some of the steel-balled heroes of these foreign squadrons for a minute. The fight was British, led by Britain and fought over England, don't think about putting the Algar on Jenkins, but this was not an English fight alone. As I hopefully got across last time, the alone bullshit is one of those dumber things which came out of the war, and I don't like the narrative at all because it's simply not true. If you look at the statistics, nearly one in four pilots came from other countries. There were Australians, there were French, Belgian, Irish, New Zealanders, South Africans, Indians, West Indians, Poles and Czechs, all of whom fought and died in the struggle to destroy the Germans. The Canadians sent their number one Royal Canadian Air Force Squadron over in June, and there were quite a few Canadian volunteers mixed in with the rest of the RAF, totalling something like a hundred in all. Uh, officially, there were just 11 US volunteers. The FBI, being the FBI, naturally found itself on the wrong side of history once again, trying to arrest anybody headed to England to fight the fascists, something that they have since ceased to do, of course. But at the same time, the FBI, being the FBI, were pretty inept at the task, and it is worth noting that quite a large number of the Canadians appeared to have no familiarity with Canadian geography and to have mysteriously lost both their passports and their birth certificates on arrival. The exact number of Americans serving, therefore, is unknown, but certainly more than the 11 quoted. On the 17th of August 1940, acting pilot officer Billy Fisk brought his badly shot up Hurricane into land on 601 Squadron's base. He had been shot and burnt badly, and later that day became America's first official military death of World War II. 
I mentioned the Poles a minute ago, and they are really worthy of a bit more of discussion. They made up fully 5% of Fighter Command's total strength in July 1940. Of these 276 or so pilots who came from Europe, 146 of them were Poles. The men who fought in England that summer believed that they would be going home at the end of it, and the tragedy is that few of them ever did. And I will come and talk about them another time, because I think their story and the way that they got here was quite extraordinary. I will just mention in passing that they first survived using some of the worst equipment that the French could muster in the form of the dreadful C714S, a plane so bad that the Finns had turned their noses up in it, and most of the Polish survivors of their invasion made their way to England rather than try and serve the French in such rubbish. Their anger, experience, elan and sheer guts when paired with either a hurricane or a spitfire were lethally effective, and 303, as I mentioned a minute ago, would go on to have the highest claims record of any squadron that summer. Whilst their lust for killing Nazis was certainly notable, they were also surprisingly adept at picking up one or two key phrases in English as well, such as, for example, you me pictures tonight, and I like you very much. I for one hope they had a marvellous fucking time when they weren't butchering Nazis. We've touched on a couple of times now, in a very consensual way, a number of the planes so far, and I think that this might be the right moment to gird my loins and talk about them a bit more. This isn't going to be speeds and turning rates and feeds and so on. Uh, thanks to the wonders of the information superhighway, you can look those up for yourself. Instead, and I think I warned everybody that this might happen a while ago, I will talk dirty to you about statistics instead, as well as talk a little bit about developmental history. So this is the ultra nerdy section of the video. Uh, do feel free to skip it if it isn't your bag. I mean, obviously, if you if you do skip it, Jenkins will know that, and he'll be putting you on a list of people who are to be engaged, uh, which is involves turning up to your house with a bag of tools late at night. Uh, for the sake of the lawyers, I will point out, of course, that, that that's not a threat. It's just the offer of some free life, life coaching. Uh, I'm conscious that I may be talking to some folks who know everything about planes, and at the same time, uh, those who know nothing. So, a quick recap for the less familiar. In very broad brush terms, the primary British fighters of the battle were the Spitfire Mark I and from August the Mark II, and the Hurricane Mark Ones with a smattering of Mark IIs from September. The British also had the Blenheim Fighter as their twin-engined monstrosity, but it was rapidly to moved into a night fighter role because it was crap. Our German friends had the 109 and the 110, both made by Messerschmitt and confusingly with the initials BF, and I won't explain why because the words are not pronounceable. Uh, if you are one of those people that had their lunch money stolen as a child and you want to know more, then the 109s were E1s and E4s mostly, and the 110s were mostly Cs and Ds at this point. There were some other exotica out there. We're going to ignore it. I mean, for example, the Italians turned up at one point, achieved absolutely nothing of note, and then went, went away again, but they're not really relevant. Uh, for the Luftwaffe, uh, there were three main bombers, the superb Ju-88, the Heinkel 111, and the flying cigar, the Doe 17, or Dornier 17. I'm not really going to discuss these bomb lorries in any great detail beyond observing that they were all pretty effective medium-range bombers, but not really capable of strategic bombing as we would understand it now. The British fighter philosophy was built around carrying 8.303 Browning machine guns in the wings of both Hurricanes and Spitfires, whereas the 109 carried a combination of two machine guns firing through the propeller and a pair of low-velocity 20mm cannon. I'm not going to get into how it fired through the prop without shooting it off. It's, a, it's an engineering and grease thing, and probably magic. Suffice to say, a gentleman of my class does not concern himself with such nonsense. Uh, the 109 was also supposed to have a further cannon firing through its engine because, well, Nazis. And because of, well, Nazis they tended to shake the engine apart, so they didn't really use them. In fact, most of the time they weren't even fitted. The cannons themselves were relatively low ammunition, low velocity units, which meant that you had to get very close to your enemy and using them sparely. But they were very effective when they made contact, and we'll talk about how that worked in a second. Likewise, the ME110 also carried a 20mm cannon and a pair of machine guns, this time mounted in the nose, which made them pretty damn punchy if you did get bounced by one. They also had a rear-facing comfort blanket pea shooter for presumably scaring birds, because it did fanny Adams to anything else. So I can hear, even as I record this, that there are a thousand Americans screaming out almost at once, My God, a 303? Are you serious? Why not a 50 cal? And this is because they are both very much more familiar with firearms than most Brits, and also because they believe bigger is always better in all situations. And my dear cousins, I love you very much, but in this case there is method behind the apparent madness. In 1933, a very experienced RAF flyer by the name of squadron leader Ralph Sawley had sat down and done a lot of complicated maths on what it would take for a fighter to shoot down a bomber. He supposed that at about 400 miles an hour, a fighter would have roughly a two-second window in which to shoot off a lethal blow at the enemy, and that it probably wouldn't get a second chance. 
Recognising that as machine guns fire and the plane moves around, the guns will recreate a sort of cone of bullets, a bit like a sort of shotgun blast in the air. And you can do some mathematics and work out exactly how many bullets per square foot would be necessary in order to create the density required to take a bomber down, which he calculated very carefully at four per square foot. And that meant that he needed at 400 yards about eight machine guns of the .303 Browning type, because that's what the army used. Hence, that's what the Spitfire and the Hurricane had been designed around. And indeed, it made them very good and stable gun platforms because it essentially been built from the guns up. Once again, this is an interesting area where Dowding put his oar in, because he saw Sawley's work and he issued the notes that would then go on to become the Hurricane and the Spitfire, specifically because of Sawley's work. However, my team Yankee brethren will be saying something along the lines of, you're crazy, the Nazis had exploding shells. Well, yes, they did, and we will discuss that in a moment, but the British were not beyond a bit of mild dickery themselves in this department. They were offered, just before the war, some incendiary rounds from the Belgian de Wilde Corporation, and having inspected them, they decided that they were basically rubbish, made of chocolate and beer or something. But the concept was quite good. And so the Royal Woolwich Arsenal got hold of a few of these and managed to spoof up something which was much more effective. But they still called them the de Wilde because it confused the Germans. What they actually had was a very, very nice incendiary round that cut up 109s very well. If we look at July and the first week of August 1940, so that five-week period, of the 70 or so 109s that were hit by British fighters, 77% of them were destroyed, which is an impressive figure. And compare that with the cannon-spitting 109s and 110s. In that same period, they destroyed just 63% of their targets, and there is no way on God's green earth that a Hurricane or a Spitfire are somehow more robust than a 109. So, which aircraft is actually better, the Hurricane, the 109 or the Spitfire? Uh, I would say it's roughly honours even. Bearing in mind that Spitfires accounted for about 30% or so of fighter command, and they were used to go up high and attack the 109s head-on whilst the Hurricanes went in to go and take the bombers on, then there are some quite interesting statistics of that same five-week period I mentioned a minute ago. Of the 115 aircraft that fighter command lost, about 75% are thought to have been hit by 109s, and just six by 110s, the rest being taken out by defensive fire from the bombers. If we include damaged machines as well, and then we look at the stats that the 109s hit, about 63 Spits and about 63 Hurricanes, which means proportionally more Spitfires were getting hit, which is kind of what you'd expect, but also that Hurricanes were not a pushover either, even when they got bounced. The Hurricane was a very decent little beastie. It was unquestionably more dangerous to fly, though. Of the 63 fighters that got hit, that statistic I gave a minute ago, fully 45 were destroyed, compared to just under half that number for Spitfires. The 109's 20mm cannon shells passed straight through the canvas of the hurricane's wings and body until it hit something important and exploded like for example the pilot or the engine and whereas they detonated on impact with the metal skin of the Spitfire the hurricane pilot death and injury rate was a lot higher too a decision had been made pre-war not to seal the forward gravity petrol tank of the hurricane with line tex, which was a thing that was done to the wing tank so that if they got shot they would self-seal the thinking here was that it would be protected by the engine block but those 20mm cannon shells were utter bastards the hurricane was much more likely to catch fire if it did, then a jet of hot flame would be pushed directly out into the cockpit over the pilot's hands and face. There was a morbid, almost but important saying, out in eight or you'll be late. It meant get out in eight seconds or less or you'll be dead or so badly burnt you'll never fly again. Pilots weren't wearing modern anti-flash or anti-burn suits. Uniforms were cotton or canvas and treated with commercial dyes that could produce toxic gases on ignition and the goggles on the pilot's eyes would melt in the heat. Very roughly, over the course of the battle, twice as many Hurricane pilots died compared to Spitfire pilots. I think it's important as we go forward in this story to think a little bit about tactics and culture because they do inform kind of what happened next. The Luftwaffe pilots in 1940 were some of the most experienced in the world and it shared knowledge deliberately and systematically in a way not done in the RAF. As an example, Adolf Galland was able to share what he'd learnt in Spain with the whole of his Geschwada, thus making even new pilots very effective from the first time they went up. They had got early lessons in combat and tactics, even if it was just in theory. And in this regard, the Nazis were miles ahead of the RAF, especially at the local level in July 1940. They flew loose formations known as Schwarm, literally a swarm, made up of two pairs of two fighters, a leader and a wingman, each pair being called a Rotten or a gang and a pack. Uh, they did not fly in a formation but held station about 300 yards apart, meaning that the whole formation could manoeuvre if it needed to, but they were close enough to offer mutual support. And equally, they weren't watching one another's wings, they were looking out at the sky in front of them. Three Schwarm made up a Staffel or a squadron and they flew staggered off one another again to make sure that no one was worrying about hitting anybody else and they could manoeuvre pretty much at the same rate that a 109 could manoeuvre. 
The RAF did eventually adopt tactics like this, but really not until a lot of young pilots had died. And in 1940, they were flying the so-called VIX of three, sometimes with a rearward sweeper, typically the most junior pilot who was inevitably killed. They flew tight, meaning that everyone was watching everyone else's wingtips and not the sky around. It looked magnificent, but there is a reason that the Luftwaffe referred to them as Idiotenheim. Worse still, RAF pilots weren't trained how to shoot as part of their pilot's course, and deflection shooting remained something of a dark art known to very few throughout the war. Adoption of new tactics was piecemeal, with individual squadron leaders having to make local choices about what to pass on and what to allow. It meant that new RAF formations, especially those without a core of experienced pilots, suffered disproportionately heavy losses when fed into the fighting during August and September. Despite all that, as a rule, RAF aces were more plentiful, even if they had fewer individual kills than their Luftwaffe counterparts, even at this point in the war. And there was a reason for that. In the Rotten, there was a Rottenführer and a Rottenflieger, uh, the latter being there solely to help his leader score kills, and the Rottenführer was there to make sure that the Schwarmführer got his kills, who in there was in turn there to make sure that the Staffelführer got his kills. Medals were awarded for the number of kills, so that the more you got, the more bits of brass you could stick onto your uniform, and competition amongst the Experten was fierce. All of this meant that a lot of Luftwaffe pilots were primarily there to soak up .303 rounds whilst their leader did the firing, and as you can imagine, this seriously undermined morale as losses went up. Each new victory kills a wingman was a saying in certain squadrons. The vast number of kills accrued by the various Luftwaffe aces masked the number of their own countrymen who'd been shot out of the sky behind them. The makeup of these two forces is also quite different and quite surprising. The RAF was a, for the 1940s anyway, a relatively egalitarian organisation. You didn't need to have got a degree or gone to the right school in order to be able to fly or indeed to get promotion. You just needed to be bright, technically adept and willing to join in. A lot of German flyers saw themselves as knights of the air and they were encouraged to think that way and they, to feel superior to those around and obviously beneath them, literally and figuratively. And whilst there was a, always a degree of that in the RAF, it was much more professional in its culture, seeing they were more like a, a, a machine in which they were there to kill the enemy, much as a computator would be there to do sums in an office. They didn't really focus so much on medals. In fact, there was a real culture of not doing so. The Luftwaffe, by contrast, contrast was inherently a political organisation, probably only second to the SS in its adherence to the Nazi cause. Its inception was an extension of the Nazi party through things like gliding clubs and a bit later the National Airline. And you needed to be either a member of the party or considered politically reliable in order to be able to go and fly. Unsurprisingly, many of the leading figures in the Battle of Britain were committed Nazis who'd spent time pre-war working to bring the Nazis to power and, of course, fighting the, for the fascist forces in the Spanish Civil War. Many former Luftwaffe flyers, like, for example, Adolf Garand, went on after the war to fly for various unsavoury South American regimes in the 1950s and 1960s. And there were, to be fair, a smattering of independent thinkers like Theo Osterkamp and the ace Hans-Joachim Marseille, but they were few and far between. OK, so let's get back to the narrative. When we left the story, the RAF was busy turning Eagle Day into Plucked Chicken Day. Time was a ticking for the Luftwaffe, who, if you remember, only had until the 15th of September to get this job done for Daddy, or he'd be very cross and probably the OKL wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. Uh, Goring was getting serious side-eye for the rest of Daddy's bitches, and he was not cool with this at all. So he sat down, got himself sober, carefully assessed his plans... <laughs> What am I such? I can't keep a straight face. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. no. He, did, he did none of those things. He just phoned up Kesselring to told him to win it by the 15th. Good one, boss. I'm sure that it had never occurred to Albert until then. Still, at least they didn't all have to trace back to fucking Kachenhall. Smiling Albert was not a fool, a committed Nazi certainly, and a man with an ego the size of a planet for sure, but a damned fine general. He was a creative thinker, a methodical man, someone with an instinctive touch for his troops, and an ability to marshal limited resources into winning positions, as he demonstrated very ably in Italy. Unfortunately, on this occasion, and one other, he came up against Keith Park, who was, frankly, just better. Following Air Fleet 3's exit, Kesselring took the reins over really all OKL planning, and having done some rather radical thinking, he ordered up some reconnaissance flights for the first time. It was a great thinking, I know, bonkers, bonkers idea, but he decided to do it anyway. And he then decided to focus down on destroying the RAF on the ground by bombing their air bases. And we're going to call this Cunning Plan for a New Hope. With a shiny new target list of airfields, he now needed to come up with a bit of a compromise. Basically, his fighters had the range of an asthmatic smoker, but they could punch quite hard. His bombers could go further, but were armed with a great deal more hope than guns. Effectively, he could choose to escort the bombers all the way, and perhaps lose his shiny fighters in the channel. Or alternately, he could have his fighters turn back early and leave the bombers to the tender mercies of Park's Hurricanes, where they would be massacred. 
So, like a teenager who discovers their local drug dealer for the first time, Kesselring decided to try a little bit of everything. A little powder here, some pills over there, a few sticks or whatever that is. Raids with small numbers of bombs on his entire fighter force. Uh, raids every 20 or 30 minutes to try and saturate the defences, hitting a single base over and over again to try and knock it out. Flying low, flying high, flying everything else in between. Uh, Biggin Hill, Debden, Hornchurch, Eastchurch, Manston, Kenley, uh, Red Hill. All these bases were hit dozens of times, again and again and again. Again, Mary quarters, electricity supplies, naffies, barracks, hangars, WAF messes, airfields, petrol dumps, air raid shelters, all of them were hit and hit hard. On the ground, heroic efforts and huge amounts of energy were required by the emergency services and bomb disposal teams, not to mention the medical staff on a daily basis. Squadrons would go up, fight and die, and the survivors would come back down to find burning bases full of new holes. For the next couple of weeks, Castlering's forces pummeled southern England, attacking forward air bases relentlessly and in the process occasionally going after things like various aircraft works. They flew 13,500 sorties between Eagle Day and the 6th of September. However, it was not working. The airfields, even really badly cut up ones like Biggin Hill, were in next to impossible to knock out and most, if not all, putting aside Manston and Biggin Hill, were back up and running within a matter of a few hours. Park and Dowding didn't need to abandon any of them. As the fighting raged, the Battle of Attrition began to develop a deeper phase. The Luftwaffe losses were beginning to mount to around 200 each week, but at this point Fighter Command was losing something like 140, a far cry either from the Luftwaffe's needed stated goal of 5 to 1 or the RAF's early August successes of 2 to 1. On paper, at least, the British were winning. Fighter Command at this point could field about two to 300 more aircraft on a daily basis than it had been able to at the beginning of the fight, despite the losses, but that did mask just how tired and cut up the pilots were becoming. Coming. Both sides were finding, for example, that new squadrons were getting fed in and hurt much harder than old hands. Nine squadrons in fighter command accounted for 40% of all of its losses in this period, but made only 25% of its claims. And here, lurking like a fresh cat turd in a recently dug flower bed, is our friend Lee Tosspot Mallory. Instead of transferring experienced squadrons to 11 Group on request, for example, flyers like Barda and his mob, he was sending the least experienced crews for rotation. He was effectively sending green young men to die for his ambition so he could get his big wang in the air. It forced Dowding to start to have to rate squadrons A, B and C, A being up to strength and good to fly with 11 Group, B being squadrons at full strength but outside of 11 Group that could be called on if needed, and C squadrons who'd been so chewed up that their pilots were considered as reserves for A and B squadrons or sent to training units. Effectively, these units ceased to exist in all but name. Dowding was forced to reduce established strength from 26 to just 16 per squadron. Men were literally falling asleep on landing. Sick rates were becoming very high amongst pilots and combat fatigue was unquestionably rife if not acknowledged. And little wonder. Typically an RAF pilot would be up at about 4.30 in the morning, ready to stand to for five. They would then be at dispersal until six or seven in the evening, and during that time they would fly a number of sorties under combat conditions, each of which would be a flood of adrenaline, run as fast as you could to the waiting aircraft, get in as the engine was started by the fitters, strap on, connect hoses, close canopy, throttle up, away. Once they were up, they were almost certain to encounter the enemy in greater numbers than their own squadron, and if their controller wasn't on her game, they could get bounced, and that always ended with deaths. Squadrons were flying 50 hours a day now with multiple sorties. A new pilot flying on their first day had a roughly 50-50 chance of being hit, and if they were hit, they had a 50-50 chance of needing to abandon their machine. If they were going to get out, they had a 60% chance of escaping unharmed, otherwise it was a 20% chance of dying or a 20% chance of hospitalisation. By the end of September, 70% of British pilots who'd flown in the previous eight weeks had bailed out at least once. If the pilot learnt and they learnt fast, then their chances of survival went up dramatically, but they didn't have a lot of time to get that learning done in. But if things were bad for the British, well, they were a lot worse for the Luftwaffe. By the end of October, statistically, every Luftwaffe pilot had either bailed out or crashed at least once. They were getting short of absolutely everything, pilots, spares, planes and ammo. The tactics weren't helping, as revised orders now meant that the fighters had to fly at the same speed as the bombers, requiring them to put their flaps down sometimes just to stay slow enough and stay in the sky. They were flying six or seven sorties a day, a standard now. Mills surveyed his frontline units between the 26th of August and the 4th of September and found that of an established strength that was supposed to be between 35 and 40 planes per group, most of them were operating at less than 50% of that figure. In July, there'd been a lot of bants about the canal kahite, or this is essentially channel fever, young bucks wanting to get their kills in and get over to England. Now it meant something quite different. It meant fuel gauge malfunctions, 
oil temperature issues, guns that wouldn't fire, broken altimeters, and pilots who were, reluctantly of course, returning to base where these issues would mysteriously sort themselves out. Cases of appendicitis rocketed, and for years afterwards veterans of the Luftwaffe asked after one another's appendectomy scars. All the while Beppo kept saying they were winning and that the RAF was down to its last 50 planes. In the air, the RAF kept sending up its last 50 planes, followed by another last 50 planes, followed by another last 50 planes, and so on. Now, famously, Hitler, as we all know, had an excellent sense of humour and a lot of patience and no problems at all with being bombed. And so, having been told to fuck off after his peace proposals back in July and having had his capital city bombed by the legends in Bomber Command, he was not in the best of moods when he addressed the sports palats on the 4th of September 1940. What he basically said was, I dare you to try that again, I'll knock your fucking lights out. Cue Bomber Command going over and doing it again and Hitler losing his fucking mind. Now, I haven't really spoken about Bomber Command throughout this, which is desperately unfair, really. Uh, they flew night after night and day after day, taking incredible losses in machines that were simply not up to the task. They are all but entirely ignored from the discussions of the battle, and I'm really not going to be able to do them justice here, but they did achieve two incredible things that I want to acknowledge. Firstly, they put preparations to sea line in a bit of a tiswas by flattening the ems Dortmund Canal on the 12th of August. They properly smashed up about 30% of the invasion barges as well. And the second thing that they managed to do was to really piss Hitler off by bombing Berlin. To hit Berlin, they'd sent seven Hamptons to the very, very limits of their range. Only one got home. The second time they tried it, five aircraft found the target and three came back. On all ops that summer, 60% loss rates were not unusual. These were magnificent men conducting an operation in the finest traditions of the British Armed Forces, using equipment that was next to useless, facing certain death and doing it anyway. And thus it was on the 7th of September that two important things happened. Firstly, Goring finally got his fat ass on a train and went to Pas de Calais to oversee the fighting, and the Luftwaffe went on an awfully big adventure to London. Kessering put up his entire remaining strength of Luftwaffe 2 and 3, that was 384 bombers and 617 fighters. And there then followed, unusually for the RAF, a variety of screw-ups that included, somewhat inevitably, Bader's big wang failing to find the enemy, meaning that the Luftwaffe went in largely unopposed. And the Germans began to ask themselves whether or not those assessments about the RAF might not be true. Perhaps it really was on its last legs. Now, sure, JG-51 had lost five pilots and nearly been wiped out in the process, but otherwise they'd basically got there and back scot-free. The weather was beginning to turn now, it was cloudy more often, and interceptions weren't as frequent, and the east end was burning all day and all night, and apparently the RAF couldn't defend it. On the 14th, the Luftwaffe hit, almost certainly by accident, the Royal Chapel at Buckingham Palace, binding suddenly the East End and the Royals together as nothing else could. It's a little bit of an aside here, but I'm just going to point out that should you be planning to, I don't know, let's say you're going to go and invade another country, uh, pick, uh, pick one, let's say a neighbour, and the one thing you can do to make sure that you quickly and effectively turn that country into a solid lump of tungsten that will become next to impossible invert to invade and do everything it can to thwart your plans is to bomb them enough to piss them off, but not enough to reduce every home to a pile of ash. And just saying, Vlad, what the fuck are you doing? Get the fuck out and go home. It ain't happening. Oh, where was that? Yes. 1940. Late summer and early autumn days were generally cloudy and a bit bitty. Raids often couldn't find their targets nor the interceptors their opponents. There were losses and sometimes they were very serious, but the Germans managed to convince themselves that while they weren't necessarily quite there yet, they sometimes had some kind of local air superiority, superiority from time to time. Hitler therefore delayed his decision on sea line for a few more days. A lot of folks have, over the years, called into question just how serious Hitler ever really was about sea line. And honestly, if I put my hand on my heart, I'm not quite sure. On the one hand, quite clearly, his navy wasn't up to the task. They, they lacked the numbers and the firepower to do more than momentarily aggravate the Royal Navy, who were the largest in the world. They could call on hundreds of vessels in 1940. On the other hand, Hitler's grasp of sanity was at best questionable, and he was a gambler on a gargantuan scale. And the preparations that were going into this thing were massive. There were more than 1,500 transport barges, more than 2,500 other transport vessels. They had enough shipping there to move 500,000 men. And preparations ran for hundreds of kilometres along the French and Dutch coasts. There were stockpiles of ammunition, of fodder, of horses, of vehicles, of food, of guns, of tanks, all the other crap that you need in order to be able to go and invade somewhere. In a war game in 1974 held at Sandhurst involving a number of the individuals who'd been around at the time, the conclusion was that the operation would have failed badly. However, that assumed that the Luftwaffe did not achieve air supremacy. Had the RAF been destroyed, or even really looked like it had been destroyed, I think Hitler might just have been mad enough to give it a go. I digress. 
On the 15th of September 1940, things changed fundamentally for both sides. Now, firstly, this started with a key moment for Keith Park, because he made the classic distracted husband mistake of failing to remember that it was his wife's birthday, which he discovered at breakfast when she casually mentioned it to him. Now, I've done something quite similar to her ladyship in the recent past, and I I don't recommend it. Uh, Jenkins, dear chap, did try and remedy the situation, but apparently a car freshener and some window cleaner are not acceptable presents. Uh, This was not an auspicious opening for Park, but I will forgive him, as I believe Dole did, on account of him being in the middle of the largest air battle in history. The second thing that happened was on the 15th that Kessering decided to order another maximum raid on London. This time he was able to scrape together just shy of 500 bombers, 120 110s and 500 109s, and Park was able to deploy against its 630 Spitfire and hurricanes. Put it a different way, the Luftwaffe could put 1,120 aircraft into 11 groups airspace that day. The margins were unquestionably then finer than they had been at any point up to now. Over the course of the day, Castle Ring sent in a series of raids attempting to overwhelm the defences. For hours at a time, their formations were attacked over and over and over again by what were supposed to be the last dregs of the RAF. During the course of the fighting, flying officer Cooper Sipley was hit hard and realised that his hurricane was going to go down, but rather than abandon his machine immediately, with a closing speed of 50 miles an hour, he simply rammed the enemy and then bailed out. Pilot officer Paddy Stevenson conducted a head-on attack against the Dornius of KG-3, shooting one down and ramming another before he too bailed out. Two other men were killed trying to do something similar that day. None of them won the Victoria Cross. It was considered brave, certainly, but not abnormally so. At about 3pm that day, in the ops room at Uxbridge, Churchill was watching the unfolding battle with mounting alarm, as across the room the lights on the tote board flashed red and showed every single squadron in 11 group as engaged. Churchill knew from previous experiences that Park's room did not show the other group's strengths, and so he walked over to Park and asked him a simple question, what reserves have we? It was a question that he'd asked Gamela in May in France as it began to fall. To his obvious shock, Park's response was the same as Gamelan's had been on that day. There are none. As Churchill later wrote, I realised that the odds were great, the margins small and the stakes infinite. That Park knew his business, his flyers were experienced, his ground controllers were on their game and the orders were clear. Each attack was countered with full strength. Park's entire force of fighters got down, refuelled and got up into the fray again, just so. For once the Big Wang actually did something. I mean, not, you know, shoot down the enemy. They were in fact bounced by Adolf Galland but it did enormous psychological damage to the Luftwaffe by simply turning up en masse and putting a lot of aircraft into the sky. The experiences of that afternoon of fanatical defence, of apparently endless seas of British fighters, of watching whole Stafflin destroyed, of escorts panicking and running, of bombers veering off and bombing at random, it broke the morale of the Luftwaffe. Stories of Spitfires aflame but pressing home their attacks nonetheless abounded. Fanatical defenders willing to sacrifice themselves to stop the bombers, and thousands and thousands of enemy aircraft intact and in the sky went round messes in the Luftwaffe home bases like wildfire as bomber crews limped home carrying the dead and dying crew members. Inevitably, the claims of the RAF for that day were too high. In fact, they were way too high. They said that they'd shot down 185 aircraft initially, when in reality it was 56. But the Luftwaffe had lost 81 dead, 112 wounded and 63 captured, whereas the British had lost 12 killed, 14 wounded and 1 captured in the Channel. On the 17th of September, Hitler's headquarters issued an order stating that the S day had been postponed until further notice. The fighting and the dying carried on, but as summer fell away and the days grew shorter, the heat of the battle died down. For 57 consecutive nights from the 7th of September, the Luftwaffe bombed London and other UK cities. The German codename for London was Loch, God of Fire, and on those 57 nights they awoke that god as London and Plymouth and Coventry and Glasgow burnt. More than 60,000 civilians were killed, a million lost their homes, and in the flames one Arthur Harris watched it all and learnt and planned and lobbied and gained ground. In late October the Luftwaffe could do no more by day and they began to withdraw their exhausted and depleted fighter units. On the 27th of October the invasion barges began to be withdrawn from the coast. On the 18th of December, Hitler issued Directive 21, ordering plans for Operation Barbarossa to begin and siege to be laid to Britain. In the final analysis, the RAF had won the Battle of Britain by the 15th of September 1940 and well before, and it had won through enduring, 
It had won because the radar operators, the observer corps, the plotters and the whole machinery of doubting system had kept on working, even under direct enemy fire. It had won because of the teams on the ground filling in holes, diffusing unexploded ordnance, handing out tea, refitting and refueling aircraft, even as the Nazis came on. It had won because of the deep thinking before the battle and the clever control during it, even under pressure that could have lost the war in an afternoon. It had won because young men, scared, tired, lonely and brave, had got into their cockpits, checked their T's and P's, and gone up again and again and again, even as their friends were shot and burned around them. It had won because men and women and children in the East End told Churchill that they could take it, even as they dug one another's bodies out from underneath the rubble that had been their homes. It won because tyranny, when confronted by democracy, loses. This video then is dedicated to the memory of the men and women of the RAF in the summer of 1940. And now, if you don't mind, I will let the Elgar roll. Thank you.